creepy voiceover and piece of sound design to start your movie. It's got me 100% in. Also right off the bat, the costuming is bananas and amazing. What are these suits? Complimenting a newer movie for having better visual effects isn't totally fair, but they finally nailed getting the sclera blue. Impressive. Denis and Gunn are two opposite ends of the spectrum for impactful directors in the modern age, and they both like Batista, probably says something. Why did the Emperor choose this path? And who will our next oppressors be? Starting this movie from the perspective of Chani is pretty inspired. Princess narration sets a different tone, and Paul isn't an underdog yet. Beginning the story with the oppressed rather than some spoiled rich kids is a quick way to win over your audience. Man, I love that title card. The same horseshoe just rotated part one? What the crap? That's not on any of the posters? None of the marketing materials. Bold move, and I absolutely love it. Finally, someone got it right. Take your dang time. To be fair, I'd imagine most 16-year-olds dream about Zendaya. Also, strap in, everyone in this film is stupid hot and it's essentially impossible to ignore. Also, way to cast someone who could actually pass for 16. No offense, Tim, but you're making it work. Give me the water. Sick interpretation of the voice, that delayed distortion. Almost. And that being in almost shows you how bonkers powerful the Bene Gesserits actually are. Known to the Fremen as Shai Hulud. Long exposure to spice has given the tribe their characteristic blue eyes, the eyes of Ibad. It's nice to know that even thousands of years in the future, people will still be watching British documentaries. This film's visualization of spice is the first time I get it. Tell me you wouldn't want to snort that, or is that what they do? Smoke it? Boof it? Whatever. Point is, it looks magical. Also, don't do drugs, kids. Getting some Endor vibes from Caladan, and I'm, I'm mad about it. This Herbert guy must have been a Star Wars fan. O.M.G. These suits, this score, that beard on that beautiful, beautiful, man, beautiful beard. Smile, Gurney. I am smiling. Poor Thanos is afflicted with a disease known as angry face, and as a sufferer of sad face, I feel his pain. How much will it cost them, this formality? Three guild navigators, a total of 1.46 million. Little details like that again show us nerds that Denis really put in the time. Also, I tried to see if rolling my eyes back helped me do math. It didn't, but I did burst a blood vessel, so there's that. So it's done. It's done. There's also some pity in the eyes of the Emperor's Herald. Everyone seems to know this is a trap. Of course, it's freaking Aquaman flying that dope skinny ship. First off, I'm not gonna die. Wow. Dreams make good stories. Everything important happens when we're awake. And just like that, Momoa Duncan surpasses all other Duncans that came before, in both how much I know about him and how much I care about him. And like him. Probably screen time, too. Hey, you. You want some muscle? I did? No. <laughs> Crap, spoke too soon. No, I love him. If your answer is no, you'll still be the only thing I ever needed you to be. My son. It's early to be crushing me here, you beautifully bearded boy. Julia really wants the backstory on these little house-shaped gravestones. In her mind, there are little elvish creatures living in them, and the real secret of Caladan is that the Atreides family are giants, so... A wife win? And just when I thought I was done buying movie-inspired weaponry. I mean, sure, the Minecraft blockiness of the shields in Lynch's Dune had their own interesting vibe, but these shields are more proof that Denis is making all the right choices. The visuals, the sounds, it's all perfect. <laughs> Feel like we might see that move again later. Like when Paul uses it. But did you notice that it's also very similar to a matador move, huh? Bulls, yeah. And grandfather fought bulls for sport. So in Lynch's Dune, we heard all the inner dialogue, but it's amazing what a look can convey. This one is confusion about why Gurney is going so hard. And it's clear from watching the duel that they start out training with what Paul is used to, controlled, quick blocking. But once he says, Guess I'm not in the mood today. Gurney starts going nuts to drive the point home. They're not human, they're brutal. Cable selling it. Yeesh, more like Getty Subprime, am I right? Yeah, I'm, I'm right. The horror? The freaking set design is out of this world. Quick, seven second shot and all that. He's amazing. Paul speaks Mandarin and sign language. Even if it's a privilege to be offered the opportunity to learn second and third languages, it's not easy and takes hard work, so I started to like this kid. Where can I get a huge hood like that? And can we normalize them so I can wear them everywhere? Capes and hoods, let's go! It's in the box. Pain. Are you sure it isn't? <laughs> Again, no inner monologue, but the impact of this scene, his stare down, the building score. Goodbye, young human. I hope you live. Weird. That's what I say to Jude when I tuck him in every night. But I mean it. A path has been laid. This entire opening 30 minutes is just filled with dread. It's clear that what happens is expected from everyone other than Paul. Leto and Jessica fully believe they're going to die. 
The distance between them for this conversation, blurred by fog, illustrating Paul's confusion and Jessica's willingness to keep him in the fog for now, might be a little on the nose, but when you make a space opera, I ain't complaining. Man, this movie is not the same without this score and sound design. It constantly feels otherworldly and foreboding. Like, score this scene with some melancholy music and it's fine. Paul is sad to leave, uncertain about his future, but he's just communing with Anakin about how much he'll hate the sand. With Zimmer's score, he's mourning his home, walking to his death, and nothing can stop him. Aw, dads and sons. I got a good feeling about this. I mean, even the bagpipes make me uncomfortable. And they really nailed the movements of the ornithopter from the books. Insect-like, beating wings, squatting, overall they look like dragonflies. Love it. Before Neuralink, I'd have been like, come on, tech bros, get on it! But now I'm all, let's not. How about we just not? I'm sure watching this in theaters was incredible, but watching it with headphones makes me feel like I'm hallucinating. The sound design is always amazing. Getting some Hamanoptera vibes. Sun's getting too high. We need to seal the doors. Space travel? For sure. Still suits that recycle 95% of your body's water? No doubt. Lasers that cut through everything? Why not? Sunglasses? GTFO, you cray. How does Jessica make sign language seem so urgent? Tooth of shy The Fremen cross desert spaces using the sandwalk. Just like Christopher Walken taught us. Nope. Still none of this. Hawken and Aten were submitted into that hole six weeks ago. Dude, now that's commitment. Look, big bubble of a man floating around and laughing maniacally is pretty great, but the way Denis designed the Baron for this movie is so much more threatening. Just the sounds from his floating device make me uneasy. And then there's an actual purpose to it beyond his immobilization. With his cloak touching the ground, it makes him look 15 feet tall, which is something he'd be into. Thufi, you are killing it with that parasol. A hostage. <laughs> I love it. Ha, yes. Hostages are the things Gurney loves and make him laugh. Ah, <laughs> Hugging. Stop there. Hey! Hey! And Hanshagur stops for no man. No old men. No countries. No men for- Hey, is that Llewellyn Moss? Also, Javier Bardem's handsome routine. Sorry. Javier Bardem is always a win. Hold. Thank you, Stilgar, for the gift of your body's moisture. We accept it in the spirit in which it was given. I gotta love Leto Hawks a lug. Like he could just spit, but he's a duke. He's classy. Gotta get some phlegm on it. I must go. That's all I have to say to you. If there was ever a better cast for Stilgar, there isn't. Yeah, but it's it's a dry heat, so whatever. Talk to Liet Kynes. Honestly, it's the way to go. You gonna replace Max von Sydow? Nah, just gender swap. Your desert boots are fitted slip fashion at the ankles. Who taught you to do that? Seemed the right way. Yeah, Charlemagne has always been ahead of the curve. Why is everything they say in Jacobsa so dang poetic? Oh, so that's why they call it Dune. Okay, so this is very likely a digital shot, but the cinematographer is constantly tricking our minds into thinking we're seeing something real. Just the way the camera operator is trying to follow the spotter and then jumps ahead slightly is a language we understand as real cinema. The DP Greg Fraser avoids the smooth movements of digital environments that have become synonymous with blockbusters and it keeps us grounded. Well, that's right out of the book and right out of science, since dragonflies really dive like this. Yes, sir. Tight callback, he actually does recognize Gurney's footsteps, even on sand. I can tell it was you by your footsteps, Gurney Halleck. So, if you've ever thought Dune is cool and all, but the idea that the sandworms can swim through sand makes about as much sense as Scrooge McDuck's swimming pool of metal coins. But what Dune 21 does is give a very plausible explanation for how they do it. Massive amounts of vibration that reduce the friction between sand particles. You can even see Paul and Gurney sinking because of the vibrations. And if you really don't believe it, take a look at this! Bless the coming and going of him. What? A shot. What a piece of music. What a number of teeth? You cannot take such risks. Yes, sir. You have responsibilities. I, I'm sorry, sir. It won't happen again. Go. Such an honest interaction. So much of Dune is otherworldly or uses alien languages or deep sci fi stuff. But right here, it's a dad letting his son know he screwed up and almost got himself killed, and the son knows it. No, you're pregnant. No, you most certainly do not. Unless a baby is crowning, you never know. Pro tip, never say this to another person. Jokes aside, I like how Paul's prophetic moments are played a little more subtly this time around. <laughs> Military and religion, what a terrifying combination. What could go wrong? Oh right, human sacrifices. Will you protect our son? With 
my life. I'm not asking his mother, I'm asking the Bene Gesserit. Man, you hear that? Those are the Bene Gesserit whispers coming in when Leto mentions them. And then when Jessica reacts as Leto's wife, the Atreides motif overpowers them. Goodness, the sound mix. Thought we'd have more time. Again, the fact that Leto knows he's gonna die in this incarnation makes it more meaningful and all much more the path is already set, plain inside a plan, yada yada yada. I should have married you. And I'm not sure I believe that anyone but these two absurdly beautiful humans made Timothy Chalamet. But then if you didn't know he was gonna die, you're all, wait, wait, but he's gonna, he's gonna be okay, right? He's Oscar Isaac. He's a pretty good cast for this surprise. <laughs> Explosions, but you know, it's Denise, so artsy explosions. I mean, genuinely, look at the contrast they create on the foreground objects and characters. Well, if that ain't a practical miniature, I, I don't, I, I think it is. The number of weapons that seem to slow down right before impact makes me think the shields are basically useless, but I, I still understand why they use them. Talk about leading by example. Gurney, you badass good guy. I like how even in the dark, you get an idea of what's happening. Red means bad. I had no choice. The Harkonnens have my wife, Mona. They take her apart like a doll. Not totally sure what that means. Pretty sure I don't want to know. That moment when you know Duncan is going to die by one of those needle things, so you're constantly waiting for it. Oh, oh, cool. Jason Momoa is Solid Snake. Yes, please. The hell, Darth? <laughs> See, the point works every time. It's bizarre how often this clip comes up. Again, maybe it wasn't the initial intention, but holy crap, is it effective. Remove her gag. That's like quizzy hizzy puberty. Give me the knife! Can't say she isn't willing to get her hands dirty. Oh, killer shot. The way the camera chases them up the hill so we experience the shock with them. There's something very unnerving about Leto being naked, which is bonkers because it's all we've been hoping for for the last 90 minutes. They just keep adding to his creep factor, rising out of focus in the background? So join her. Yeah, and also his power factor. Look, he's a smart guy and it's a smart move, but I also love the insinuation that even with Leto incapacitated and on his deathbed, the Baron is afraid of him enough to wear his shield. You tell the great house of the last right how we were betrayed? Duncan's alive, who would've thought? The Emperor sent us here to die. Eh, that's like the main thing Emperors do. It's like Emp 101. There's something so creepy and bug-like that he's all hunched up on the ceiling. You could say it's Kafka-esque. I wouldn't, because that, that's gauche, but you could. You can be gauche. <laughs> Yo, can't wait to see this version of Muad'Dib. The only war spreading across the universe like unquenchable fire. Well, that's rarely a good thing. Unless your eyes turn blue and your hair gets early 2000s spiky. A war in my name! But I like that it terrifies him. Kyle Chandler was way too cucumber cool for this revelation. Chalamet responds the way a 16-year-old would. Speaking of versions of Muad'Dib, there's a wife win. And I love that he takes his name from this little guy. It's like finding out that the most badass warrior of all time was named Hamster. Which, yeah, yeah that would work. There's something so creepy about the way they float down like this. Cool too, creepy and cool. Oh, no! Duncan, no! Duncan is almost too much for this movie. No! Duncan, you badass good guy. Self-sacrifice. Man, I love this version of Duncan. He's uncynically important to Paul, like an older brother this time. But even without that, he's so dang cool. Dude kills a bunch of guards single-handedly, and then blows up three ships, and then really kills a bunch of Sardaukar single-handedly while sacrificing himself. Dude even gets stabbed and mercs more fools. So, so much better. Badass good guy. The lighting in this movie is something else. They use the darkness more than summer blockbusters usually do. Those in the know get a fun tease of why she's calling a sandworm and what those ice axe looking things are for, and everyone else gets a fun mystery to ponder. I serve only one master. His name is Shai Halud. Self-sacrifice from a badass good girl. No doubt, it definitely is, but it's also the body saver sometimes. It's still a dope line. Yikes. But something of a nod to Lynch's weird oil bass for the Baron? And the Furman. Kill them all. Another frightening delivery from Skarsgård, but ha, good luck, nerds. If you thought cracking glass and breaking metal wings off was a bit extreme for a sandstorm, don't forget this. Sandstorm's powerful enough to cut through metal. From inside the Thopter, you can barely see the world spinning, but I love that their hair stands up and the music goes nuts. It sets the most high anxiety tone and it grounds the sequence again. No real aerial god view to see what's going on. We're in there with them, documentary style. Okay, 
So around this part of the book, Jessica starts to realize that her son is growing up, and Paul starts to realize how powerful he is. So that's the only explanation I could think of for the looks these two just gave each other, that under literally any other circumstances would be called thirsty. I'm sorry, you all saw it. I, I don't make the rules. Not gonna lie though, they look dope. Sub-Zero and Scorpion headed off into the unknown. Gross, but cute. Gross or cute, gross or cute. Groot. <laughs> Hey now, that's Toto's theme from Lynch's Dune, or at the very least it's an homage to it. It's crazy how easy it was to make Duncan important, just crazy. It's not fair to compare two pieces of media from decades apart, but holy crap is this more terrifying than anything that happened in those other ones. The low angle of the shot, the sand exploding in the background, the score yelling at us with an alarm sound. Denis, my man, Denis. Terror, just pure terror. And I know this shot was spoiled in the trailer, but damn. It's so cool. It really just shows you how immense the worms are. The closest we have on this planet are whales, and they're not even in the same ballpark, and you know how I feel about them. Bad. We need their water. I guess you could say Jamis is thirsty for them too. <laughs> Never before have so many attractive people been this close to killing each other. Why didn't you say you were a weirding woman? Denise still doesn't go into total detail here, but I find the idea that the Bene Gesserit essentially go around to different worlds, making civilizations aware of their powers and turning it into a religion just in case one of their witches ends up there, just so compelling. I mean, it's right out of Who Mourns for Adonais, but still compelling. But you look like a little boy. He chose the hardest way up. Right? It's kind of his thing. Still, Johnny Burn. I invoke the Amtal. Can't say for sure what the Amtal is, but when stuff starts getting invoked, it's fairly good news. Even as a person who's read and seen every version of this story, I still didn't quite know where we were headed here. Yodorowsky had some different ideas about Paul's story, and Denis gave us Paul's visions of Jamis. The trick of having this future where Jamis is his mentor or Paul dying keeps us guessing. Generosity? Jamis is a good fighter. He won't let you suffer. Encouragement? Hey. Take a beautiful beard win, Stilgar. Call back to his boy, Duncan. Pretty solid salute. Is he toying with him? I mean, kinda. <laughs> hey, Jamis, how does it feel to get repeatedly dunked on? Paul has never killed a man. New England in the 90s had lots of issues, but I gotta say I'm happy that I grew up in a time and place where the fact that I'd never killed a man by 16 wasn't abnormal. While we're at it, I don't live in a culture where the greatest insult would be not being killed in a duel to the death. Jamis is livid, and it's not because he's about to die. Once the fight is all over, you realize that while maybe Paul's visions were possible eventualities, they also metaphorically come true. Jamis does teach Paul the ways of the desert, and Paul's youth and innocence do die when he's forced to kill Jamis. This really is such a bummer, and it's so well done. They don't hate him, it's just their way. But now one of theirs is dead. Oof. Spider. <laughs> MJ's all about the Kwisatz man now. Not this one. This one. Love this dang score. Love it. Just, I love it. Sick. I love that Denny threw this in. Nobody knew if a part two would happen, so at least let us know this is a possibility in part one. This is only the beginning. But yeah, it's called part one. Who would have thought it would have been a complete story? Man, this final piece feels like the culmination of everything this movie has been telling us through the score. And going back, it's very much a combination of the rock piece we got when Paul was leaving Caladan and a very similar melody, but with mostly vocals from when Paul actually steps out into the desert. The two together somehow create a more upbeat ending than I would have expected. Dang it, this movie is so much better than I ever expected. And that was going in with high expectations. And much like everyone else, no idea it was a part one. It's just so well made. The existence of the previous versions actually make this one even better. It's like you can see these arrows pointing to almost identical scenes saying, this is how you do this scene. It's Denis Villeneuve, so you know the visuals and tone will be on point. Beautifully shot, epic landscapes, brutal battles, creepy when it should be, classic over-the-top Denis sound, sometimes almost oppressive. But it pulls back at the right moments. For a movie that is essentially about a big trap, Zimmer's music and the sound design as a whole really add to the claustrophobic, anxiety-filled tone. It's a movie you could watch without any dialogue and still understand what you're supposed to feel. And then the cast is out of this world, even if the criticism for not casting Middle Eastern actors as the Fremen is totally valid. Still, all the parts went to talented actors. Babs Alusamokun in particular is fantastic as Jamis. The book spends a little more time with Jamis's indignation with Stilgar, but Babs says everything we need to know with his face and eyes.
but everyone goes for it and not in an acting way. Shang Chen's UA gets minimal screen time but does the most with it. Our boy Polka Dot Man has like a total of three minutes of screen time and still somehow manages to creep us out. And I love Jason Momoa, but I think we were all a little wary of how he'd play Duncan, but he's incredible, he nailed it. He embodied what made Duncan Idaho, a character with the weirdest name in a book filled with weird names, such a beloved fan favorite from said book. And Brolin, he's obviously the goat, but sadly Denis must have forgotten to have Gurney sing. That's right, in the books, Gurney has a beautiful voice and sings to raise everyone's spirits. Here's hoping they get that done in part two. The three big guns, Rebecca Ferguson, Oscar Isaac, and Timothy Chalamet don't really need their praises sung. They were all perfectly cast and filled each role better than I could have hoped for. I think it'll be easier to talk themes after part two, but it's not like this movie is empty of a message. There's a lot going on. Environmentalism versus capitalism, feudalism and slavery, religion, duty, loyalty and responsibility. And somehow all that macro political stuff happens around a coming of age story for Paul. Just on sheer screen time, his mom carries the most significant load, but Duncan and Leto both impart things to him that he takes forward into the story. Lynch's version of Paul came off as a cocky savant at times who was frustrated, but also fully embraced his path. Denis and Timothy created a Paul that is unsure, even terrified of what he may have to become. And he learns quickly that he can't trust his visions. It's such a great setup, but at the same time tells a story I'm gonna keep coming back to. I don't really have many complaints. It's a bit dark sometimes. I guess some of the whispers were unintelligible without subtitles. And actually, where the crap is Fade Ralpha? Curious if he'll show up in part two. But much like how many of the wins should actually be pointed at the books, most of the other problems were directly from the book. Goofy lines of dialogue goofy names. There's just no way to say some of the words in this movie and make it not sound ridiculous. I know all words are made up, but Kwisatz Hatterach rhymes with knickknack paddywhack and we should all laugh at that. Looking forward to part two and maybe Dune Messiah? Apparently a Dune The Sisterhood series is coming to HBO? Excited to see a property go from unfilmable to six seasons in a movie. And honestly, anytime a movie based on a book gets big, it gets people reading, which is a net win for society. Next week, we're doing one from last year, so it's, it's still pretty new. All the night, all the night, all the night, my sin and bomb all the night. All the night, all the night.